Two years after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, media from both sides of the political aisle is using a similar language to describe the evacuation. We see words such as botched, betrayal, debacle, a chaotic retreat, bloody shambles that was always destined for disaster, with scathing reports now shedding light on what the New Yorker called an uncomfortable truth. What's more, according to a Gallup poll, 50% of Americans think the war in Afghanistan was a giant mistake, that Afghanistan is no better off or is even worse after the US's 20-year presence there. 61% of Americans, according to an NPR PBS NewsHour Marist poll, did not approve of the handling of the withdrawal process. The Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country won't happen, we heard from the White House prior to the evacuation, which also said the withdrawal would be hasty and would be done responsibly, deliberately, and safely. President Joe Biden later talked of the extraordinary success of this mission, words he had to roll back later while facing a barrage of criticism. In 2023, one U.S. soldier who saw it all looked back and said the entire thing was a catastrophe. Like many other soldiers who risked their lives to get people out of Afghanistan, this man had seen bodies ripped apart in terrorist attacks, the body parts of victims tangled in razor wire, he'd seen his own fallen brothers and sisters in arms literally blown to pieces, he'd witnessed mobs of desperate Afghan citizens trying to escape the country heave and sway in killer crowds, adults suffocating in mad stampedes as they held their screaming infant children in their hands, children soon to become orphans. I've never seen anything like it said another U.S. soldier, a hardened veteran of war who, like many people, wondered how the military might of the USA could be chased out of a country by poorly armed, badly led men who looked more like farmers than trained combat fighters. Was it all worth it? Many have asked. As one U.S. commentator on the war stated, two and a half thousand American dead, 20,000 injured, a trillion dollars or more expended, and for what? As you'll see later in this video, it was actually more like two trillion dollars. The withdrawal from Afghanistan was the embodiment of chaos, where goodwill, bravery, savagery, and downright deadly mistakes snowballed into something unbelievably nightmarish. This is the full story. The Early 1990s It's the early 90s. Afghanistan has just seen anti-communist guerrilla warriors be victorious. The Mujahideen, who with $20 billion in funding from the USA, has come out on top. The collective was made up of various groups fighting the Soviets, each with pro-Islamic objectives but still independent of each other. With the Soviets gone, the rebels are fragmented across Afghanistan. One of those rebel groups is the Taliban. The Taliban, a word that means students in the Pashto language, emerges as the greatest power amongst the rebels. They are a Sunni Islamist nationalist group made up of mostly peasant farmers and men who have studied Islam in Afghani and Pakistani religious schools. These men have promised to restore order to Afghanistan after the Soviets exited in what was a nine-month-long withdrawal ending in February 1989. The order the Taliban is talking about is in line with Islamic law, Sharia, a law that today in 2023 is in full swing, a curse for many people living in the country, especially women. The mid-90s By 1996, the Taliban has exerted its influence all over the country. This year, they claim victory in the province of Herat on the border with Iran. A year later, they take the capital, Kabul. This is a city that has once been a major stop on the so-called hippie trail, where Westerners on their way to India in the 70s would stop off to smoke spliffs and admire the arts and crafts sold on Chicken Street. It's already hard to imagine in 1996 that Kabul used to be such a center of vibrant hedonism. Hedonism is exactly what the Taliban doesn't want in their country. These religious fundamentalists are not very much fun. In 1998, they have control over about 90% of Afghanistan promising the people law and order, peace and stability. They win the hearts and the minds of much of the population who've seen their lands destroyed by conflict with the foreign occupier. The Taliban sell the people on peace and unity, saying they are at the heart of Afghan identity. Many welcome the Taliban when they see their roads are safer and commerce begins to flourish again. They're happy when they see corruption among officials being prosecuted. The Taliban does try to stamp out lawlessness admittedly with acts such as amputations for theft and beheadings for serious crimes. In terms of human rights, they're also breaking the law. For others in the country, much of the educated and the affluent, the Taliban's brand of rough justice and views on women's rights, which are almost no rights, is from an age gone by. They are no fans of the Ministry for the Promotion of Virtue and Prevention of Vice, which demands males grow beards while ordering women to cover themselves up with a burqa lest they be publicly whipped. This was a country that in the 1970s was seen as progressive for this part of the world. 
Women, educated women, walked down the street with their hair flowing down their shoulders, some dressed in high heels and short skirts, chatting with many Western men on their adventures across the world in search of freedom and deeper meaning. As an Afghan woman told Amnesty International recently, as a girl I remember my mother wearing miniskirts and taking us to the cinema. My aunt went to university in Kabul. In the mid-90s, the Taliban put an end to all of that. They banned TV, cinema, music, and said women should not study after the age of eight. They're now not allowed to even work or leave the house without a male at their side. The Taliban might have brought back some amount of stability in a terribly unstable nation, but they've brought with it the archaic brutalities of flogging, stoning, and public humiliation. In 1996, they cut off the end of a woman's finger as punishment for wearing nail polish. They later found a secret school run by a woman, who is then thrown down some stairs and tortured, warned that if she doesn't plead loyalty to them, they'll stone her family to death. Women are whipped constantly for breaches of perceived impropriety. It's a human rights disaster. Many people flee. Many become part of a resistance, but to understand this video today, you need to know that they also had support. The Taliban's version of law and order is perhaps good for certain hardliners and certainly good for pro-Taliban elites, but it's not good at all for many modern thinkers in Afghanistan. One day in the future, it'll be the reason why women will risk their lives trying to escape when the Taliban, once a beaten force, comes back to power and the US tries to get tens of thousands of people out of the country in what will turn out to be a very rushed affair. 1999 The UN Security Council this year adopts Resolution 1267, an Al-Qaeda and Taliban sanctions committee which states that the Taliban are in cahoots or at least hiding the terrorist organization Al-Qaeda. The UN imposes sanctions on funding, arms shipments, and travel. September 9, 2001 Ahmad Shah Massoud, an Afghan politician and powerful military commander who fought against the Soviets and later led a Northern Alliance coalition against the Taliban, is killed. He's injured in a bomb attack and later dies in a hospital. The mastermind behind the taking out of this celebrated guerrilla fighter and sometimes friend of the West is none other than Osama bin Laden, the man who's dedicated his life to fighting what he calls Western imperialism and super-aggressive foreign policy. He's a terrorist of the highest order already at this time on the FBI's most wanted terrorist list. A poet, a soccer fan, and an ultra-violent religious fundamentalist, Bin Laden once studied English at Oxford University, but he's come to detest the West, especially the superpower of the USA. In reaction to the US's military-focused foreign policy, he once said, all citizens bear responsibility for its government's actions, and civilians are therefore fair targets. Welcome to terror, and what will be a war against it? September 11, 2001 Al-Qaeda terrorists hijack four U.S. commercial airliners, crashing them into the World Trade Center in New York City, as well as the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. A fourth plane goes down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Around 3,000 people die. Americans are in shock. The whole world is in disbelief. In a speech to the nation, President George W. Bush says solemnly, Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. He ends his speech by promising, America has stood down enemies before and we will do so this time. None of us will ever forget this day. Yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Soon the world will find out that Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda movement are behind the attack. Of the 19 hijackers, 15 belong to the nation of Saudi Arabia, two from the UAE, and one each from Lebanon and Egypt. Nonetheless, the Taliban is accused of hiding bin Laden, and this is how our story turns into the American war in Afghanistan. October 1, 2001 News media reports that the Taliban has admitted that bin Laden is hiding in a secret location inside Afghanistan for his safety and security. Kabul's ambassador to Pakistan, Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif, states he is under the control of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. This is a turn of events, since only days before the Taliban said they had no idea where bin Laden was. Mullah Muhammad Omar, the one-eyed spiritual leader of the Taliban and founder of the Taliban, says on TV that the Americans as a country are cowardly and he infuriates Americans even more by saying not to worry as they don't have the courage to come here. In November, he talked about the destruction of America, saying he hoped the country would fall to the ground. This is an America in mourning a country looking for revenge or at least some kind of justice. To say Omar poked the bear would be an understatement. Much of the US population still in grief was glowing like red-hot pincers taken from a fire and ready to be plunged into the enemy. Many years from now, though, 
These same people may believe their country's government sought revenge in the wrong places, but right now, people's emotions are still naturally inflamed by what's happening. Bush tells the US public that the US will win the war against terrorism and later orders the Taliban to deliver the United States authorities all the leaders of Al-Qaeda who hide in their land. October 6, 2001 The US military, with British support, start bombing Taliban forces on this day officially launching Operation Enduring Freedom. Australia, Canada, France, and Germany also say they will join in, with all Western allies working with the anti-Taliban Northern Alliance and ethnic Pashtun anti-Taliban forces. Both these groups in Afghanistan have already been causing mayhem for the Taliban. The Westerners will need plenty of support. They know little about this country. At this point in time, the US doesn't even have a decent map of Afghanistan's terrain. Donald Rumsfeld will later say in his memoirs that they were having to use old British Empire maps of Afghanistan. This and the ignorance of various other matters related to this very distant nation will prove to be a hindrance to fighting as time goes on. As critics will later say, the war started as a righteous sounding war, with Americans still mourning, their minds scarred by moving pictures of people jumping from smoldering tall buildings. At this point, the US is seen by many as a crusader carrying aloft the sword of justice, bringing it down on tyranny and defeating evil. But as time goes on, the war takes many complexities. People will start asking, what are we doing there? What do we want at the end of it? Is it worth all the money and the lives it's costing? Many Americans will want to withdraw, but as you'll see, withdrawal will be complicated. November 2001 The Taliban is roundly beaten by foreign and international forces. On November 14, the UN Security Council passes Resolution 1378. This demands that a central role for the United Nations be established as a transitional administration in the country, while member states are invited to send peacekeeping forces to promote stability and deliver aid. December 5, 2001 an interim pro-West government is formed. December 9, 2001 The Taliban regime falls after its forces hold up their hands in Kandahar, and its leader, Mr. Omar, goes into hiding. Al-Qaeda leaders do the same. April 17, 2002 President Bush announces a plan to build an Afghanistan that is free from this evil, the Taliban, and is a better place in which to live. Congress puts aside $38 billion in humanitarian and reconstruction aid for Afghanistan that will be spent until 2009. In the coming months, the US will begin to work on reconstruction. American big business has secured contracts worth many billions. Afghanistan and Iraq, another enemy in the war on terror following 9-11, together will cost the US $5 trillion. That is a lot of money, a lot of risk, but there is still optimism among many Americans. May 2003 U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld announces that major combat in Afghanistan has ended. President Bush tells the American people it's mission accomplished in Iraq. It's not. Not by a long way. The war on terror is actually still in its first phase. A little thing called ISIS hasn't even popped its ugly head up yet. 2005 and 2006 We see a new constitution in Afghanistan, a new president, and what looks like democracy. But in 2006, we also see the UN coalition falling out over commitments and risks. While insurgencies cause havoc with attacks throughout the country, these attacks will go on for years. 2009 In light of the attacks, the new US President Barack Obama pledges to send 17,000 more US troops to the war zone in Afghanistan to counter what is now a worrying Taliban resurgence. By August this year, between 60 to 68,000 US troops are involved in operations in the country. The British have also sent a few thousand men and put aside $23 billion. Other NATO countries and Afghans are also involved in reconstruction efforts while fighting what still seems to be like a good fight. May 1, 2011 Bin Laden is killed by US forces in Pakistan. Polls now show the majority of Americans don't want their troops in Afghanistan anymore. Men and women are dying, and it's expensive to fight and reconstruct a foreign nation that to some extent doesn't want you there. The Brookings Institute will later say, American policy was guided by fantasies. What it thought the Afghan people wanted and what they actually wanted were two different things. Many Americans are critical of the US's presence in Afghanistan. Later, the LA Times will write, the only winner in Afghanistan was America's military industrial complex. That's how many Americans already feel in 2011. But many others worry about what'll happen if the Americans leave. Will Afghanistan become a cauldron of US hating terrorists? where young men are schooled on how to murder en masse people they call infidels. This is one major reason why some people are reluctant to pull the troops out. 
They want to see a reconstructed Afghanistan a safer place where democracy flourishes. With the benefit of hindsight, a writer for Politico will say in 2021 what many people felt in 2011. Less money could have been spent, fewer lives could have been lost. But that America couldn't have done much more than muddle along for years in the face of a relentless enemy is the unsatisfying, sometimes frustrating coda to our longest war. This writer, Carter Malkassian, one-time senior advisor to General Joseph Dunford, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was in Afghanistan back in the day, seeing with his own eyes how the local police and the average Afghan soldier were less interested in fighting than the Taliban forces were. He explained, More Afghans were willing to serve on behalf of the government than the Taliban, but more Afghans were willing to kill and be killed for the Taliban. That edge made the difference on the battlefield. He cited a 2012 Asia Foundation survey which he called the most respected survey of the Afghan people. The survey revealed that of those who sympathized with the Taliban, 77% said it was because the Taliban were Afghans, Muslims, and waging jihad. While many Afghans did not want to live under the strict autocracy of the Taliban, for many others it wasn't hard to convince them that the foreign occupiers were their true enemy. These occupiers, saying they'll rebuild the country, didn't even speak the language and never understood much about Afghan customs and beliefs. But Afghans who allied themselves with the US felt that they'd be in danger if the US left. The US had a duty of care. The war seemed impossible to win and impossible to lose outright, but now it was hard to get out. The US and its allies had dug a really big hole for themselves. A Pew Global Attitude survey said that the majority of people in 16 out of 22 countries wanted the military forces to be withdrawn as soon as possible. 2015. President Obama reduces the number of US troops in Afghanistan to 10,000. This is down from 100,000 in 2011. This is good news for many Americans. In an earlier Gallup poll, 48% of Americans said they didn't even know why American soldiers were in Afghanistan in the first place. 2017. As the strength of the Taliban grows, the US drops its most powerful non-nuclear bomb, the 20,000-pound, $170,000 GBU-43B Massive Ordnance Air Blast at a cave complex where the Islamic State operatives are believed to be hiding out. The now President Donald Trump calls it very, very successful, but no casualty numbers are given. This mother of all bombs is so large that it has to be dropped from a cargo plane. The Afghan government is in the loop, according to the New York Times. Notably, Afghanistan's former president, Hamid Karzai, said this is not the war on terror but the inhuman and most brutal misuse of our country as testing ground for new and dangerous weapons. It is upon us Afghans to stop the USA. You should know that this is a man that used to be a friend of the USA. At the same time, the US military calls the war with the Taliban a stalemate. 2018. The US launches airstrikes against opium labs in the country in an effort to reduce the Taliban's finances. The Trump administration cuts off billions of dollars of assistance to Pakistan after accusing the country of helping to hide Taliban operatives. 2019. Peace talks are on the table if the Taliban promises to ensure no terrorists thrive on their soil. In December, the New York Times writes, US to withdraw about 7,000 troops from Afghanistan. 2020. In March, it's reported that the Taliban has launched a series of attacks against Afghan forces. 76 such attacks occur across 24 provinces. This comes after the US military and the Taliban signed a peace agreement. Now the US is concerned that they might be leaving the Afghan people to be slaughtered. If they leave, will the Taliban go on a rampage? The Taliban says no, but the attacks are hardly confidence-inspiring. Still later in the year, the Taliban and the Afghan government meet in Qatar to discuss a willingness for peace while talking about a new framework for governing the nation. April 14, 2021 President Joe Biden announces that the US will withdraw all troops by May 1st. Echoing Trump's previous statements about forever wars, Biden says it's time to end America's longest war. He says 3,500 troops in Afghanistan will retreat no matter what. It has to end, he says. NATO troops will also leave. Over the years, 1,144 non-US NATO soldiers have been killed, mostly British at 457, Canadian 159, and French at 90. 66,000 to 69,095 Afghan security forces have lost their lives in the war, as have 52,893 Taliban, a couple thousand ISIS, and 2,400 Al-Qaeda. After spending what's said to be about $2.3 trillion, the US is leaving, with 2,324 US military personnel dead and 3,917 US contractors dead. 46,319 Afghan civilians have also died in the conflict 
and around 67,000 people have been killed in Pakistan in relation to the war. Amnesty International says both sides, Taliban and coalition forces, committed war crimes, including torture and massacres. With these numbers in mind, not to mention the hundreds of thousands of displaced people, the trauma of a nation and the destruction of buildings and farmland, it's a hard pill to swallow for some to leave the Taliban back in power just as they were when all this started. Still, the White House will later say, there were no signs that more time, more funds, or more Americans at risk in Afghanistan would have yielded a fundamentally different trajectory. It's game over. David has felled Goliath, not with one stone, but with bloody perseverance and the fact that they could always say they were the ones being occupied by a foreign invader. It was never going to be easy turning the people against who many perceived as their own kind. But this has left the American allies in Afghanistan, the many critics of the Taliban, the US partners in a very tenuous position. Biden's words on this day have sent shockwaves throughout Afghanistan. The Taliban doesn't exactly have a good track record where human rights are concerned. This, they think, is going to be the end of us. Many start scrambling to leave. May. The one thing the US doesn't want now is a messy evacuation. The Americans send security alerts and make tens of thousands of direct phone calls to US citizens in Afghanistan and also to US partners. The White House talks about the possibility of a rapid deterioration of the security situation and the collapse of the Afghan government. High-risk scenarios are discussed, but no one expects what will happen. They don't see a house of cards collapse. The projections are not close to the reality that will happen. July. As the Americans gradually pull out, the Taliban seizes control of Afghanistan piece by piece, district by district. This month, the US intelligence community warns that the current Afghanistan government will be no more in 6 to 12 months. They're about to get a big surprise. August 14th. Now that the Taliban are in control of all border crossings in the country, Kabul airport is the only secure way out. There are about 3,000 US troops at the airport, as well as 600 British troops. Their primary mission is to ensure the safe passage of embassy staff, nationals of their countries, and coalition forces out of Afghanistan. Diplomats have been told to destroy all documents in their offices, to even get rid of anything with logos and flags on them just in case the Taliban misuses them later. The destruction effort means that many of the documents and passports of Afghans who applied for visas to get out of the country are now gone. Panic already fills the streets as the Taliban surround Kabul. Worried citizens see the Americans on the move. It feels like the beginning of a storm, like a giant person-consuming tornado heading into the city to swallow everyone up. US media announces the Department of State advises all people waiting for processing to find shelter and wait for further instructions. They should not go to the airport until they are called to do so and should follow the instructions carefully. People are scared out of their wits. Many have worked with the Americans. Women who have jobs or are studying don't want to live under Taliban oppression. Some of them have queued outside the embassy for weeks before this day, but to no avail. August 15th. Chaos is in the air as the Taliban take control of Kabul. US Army CH-47 Chinooks and UH-60 Blackhawks are seen collecting embassy staff. Military vehicles buzz around, more than aware of the Taliban presence. About 5,000 troops, mostly from the US, are still in the city. Another 1,000 arrive to protect the airport. It won't be enough. Crowds of people ignore orders and head to the airport, running, pushing their way forward. As they arrive, they see heavily armed US soldiers. They see activity, hope, people leaving on planes. Some wave their passports in the air, screaming they too have been promised passage out of the country. More trucks arrive in the city filled with men armed with US-made weapons that they've taken from the Afghan forces. Many of these men on the trucks joined the cause after losing family members in the war. They are more than motivated to fight the US-backed Afghans. Some of them race to the presidential palace. This is what victory feels like. They finally won, they think. The streets of Kabul are filled with people running in all directions. Cars honk amidst the occasional gunfire. Women are seen clawing their faces, crying, muttering. The Taliban are here. Kabul has fallen. The Taliban shoots warning shots in the air, telling them there's no need to leave, that it's safe for them, that they're here not as aggressors but as saviors. For the women, these are lame words. The Taliban uses their trucks and guns to herd the people away from the place they want to go, the airport. They aren't shooting anyone, but they are certainly not afraid to beat them back with sticks and the butts of their rifles. These are newly acquired rifles, trophies of a sort. During the Taliban's successes in taking back control all over Afghanistan, they have unarmed Afghan forces who over the years have made use of the billions of dollars of military hardware supplied by the Americans. 
The Taliban have seized 650,000 weapons, 350,000 M4s and M16 rifles, 65,000 machine guns, 25,000 grenade launchers, and 2,500 mortars and howitzers. On this day's initial push to the airport, close to 5,000 people have arrived. There's no way in hell they'll all get through today. The Americans put up more barriers, but people try to charge through them and climb over them. They breach the barriers, running onto the runway. The US and British troops try their best to push them back, sometimes having to fight them off. If these people remain on the runway, no one will get out. The soldiers, mostly US Marines and British paratroopers, do everything they can to clear the runways. This is incredibly unnerving for them. Anyone could be in these crowds, desperate civilians or desperate terrorists, with bombs strapped to their bodies. August 16th. Early in the morning, crowds wait outside the airport. People are shouting, crying, some have had no water for 24 hours. As the day heats up, maybe 8 or 10,000 people are now at the airport, each desperately trying to get out. Apache helicopters fly overhead, swooping down low to disperse the crowds who've reached the runway. Why aren't they taking us? One woman can be heard asking. They said they'd take us. Outside the wall, it's like a scene from a zombie movie. US soldiers shout again and again, get back, get back. They fire warning shots. They have no idea if any of these people are carrying bombs or guns. They have to protect the airport and the people inside it. If those outside have any chance of getting in, they need to be processed first in an orderly manner. Right now, that seems all but impossible. In the evening, there's a mad stampede outside the wall. A woman is crushed as she's still holding onto her child's hand. Shots can be heard. No one knows who fired them. The crowd sways again. A man and two children lay dead on the floor when it clears. A massive C-17 military transport aircraft now lands at the airfield. It's soon surrounded by countless people running to the side of it, touching it as if by doing that they'll simply vanish with the plane to a distant land, a safe haven. Get those people off the damn runway, a US officer can be heard shouting. The troops try their best, but they're overwhelmed. They can't just shoot them. The C-17 picks up speed, but people have climbed onto the side now. This is an act of utter desperation. When the plane takes off, they fall to the ground and crash on the runway. Some of them chose to jump. The crowd down below couldn't see why, but these men had sat where the wheels were, and when the pilot retracted the wheels, the men had two choices, be crushed or jumped, so they jumped. One of them was Fida Muhammad, a 24-year-old dentist who had been doing well in Kabul after opening his own dental clinic. He landed on a house roof, waking the owner up, who went outside and saw two battered bodies lying on the roof. The US military later reported that they found human remains in the wheels when the plane landed in Qatar, but didn't say how many bodies. It was also discovered that a 17-year-old soccer player, a big Lionel Messi fan, had been crushed on the runway when he got in the way of the wheels. He just called his brother and told him, pray for me, I'm going to America, to which the brother responded, what will you do in America? Several times, the Americans and British lose and regain the use of the runway. Now there are dead bodies lying around that need to be cleared off. Families stand around the deceased, weeping. Get them off the runway, an officer screams to his men. Some of these soldiers will need psychological counseling for what they've just seen. British soldiers will also receive therapy. After seeing something that later happens to their American military friends and Afghanistan civilians, for many the withdrawal will be more traumatic than the war itself. There's only one thing they can do. The Americans ask Afghan special forces to clear the airport and the runway. The Afghan soldiers don't ask politely. They don't even push people around, they mow the civilians down in trucks, shooting some of them. It turns into a small massacre, dead bodies everywhere. A US soldier later says in an interview, but it cleared the runway. No one knows how many Afghan civilians have died already in the crush or on the runway, but the number that people back home hear from the media is almost certainly less than the reality. In a speech, President Biden says he made the right decision despite the chaos. However, he and everyone else did not expect Kabul to fall so quickly. He said, the truth is, this did unfold more quickly than we had anticipated. So what's happened? Afghanistan's political leaders gave up and fled the country. The Afghan military collapsed, sometimes without trying to fight. He adds, we gave them every chance to determine their own future. What we could not provide was the will to fight for that future. He says the withdrawal was always expected to be hard and messy, but no one really expected it to be this messy. And soon, hard and messy will feel like unsuitable adjectives. Things are going to get much worse than hard and messy. August 17th, the Taliban orders a press conference in an effort to persuade the thousands of people at the airport to stay in the country. Their spokesman says, there's nothing to fear, don't fear the country. The hatred is over, you don't need to escape. He adds, his excellency says those who stood against us will all be forgiven. 
everyone is forgiven. Those at the airport can go home right now, nothing will happen to them. A year later, in 2022, Amnesty International writes about life under the Taliban after the withdrawal. Peaceful protesters faced arbitrary arrests, torture, and enforced disappearance. The Taliban conducted extrajudicial executions, arbitrary arrests, torture, and unlawful detention of perceived opponents with impunity, creating an atmosphere of fear. Public executions and floggings were used as punishment for crimes such as murder, theft, illegitimate relationships, or violating social norms. They didn't go around massacring people in the streets after the US left, but they hit any kind of criticism with a sledgehammer. At the press conference, they said women could work. Yet an Afghan female reporter that very day was denied entrance to the conference because she was a woman. The Afghan Minister for Women's Affairs later said she was told outright that if she did not leave the city within three days, she would be assassinated. At least now, the Americans have the people back outside the barriers. They've fortified three gates, the North Gate, the East Gate, and the Abbey Gate. Masses of crowds push against all of them. Many are up to their waists in the filthy water of a sewage canal. Some are collapsing from exhaustion. An order is given. The Marines on the ground cannot believe their ears. They are to work with the Taliban, the same guys they've been trying to kill for 20 years. The agreement is that the Taliban will take care of external security and the Americans can concentrate on the inside of the airport. An agreement had to be made. Both the US and the Taliban have received intel stating ISIS is about to attack. Still, a soldier will later say, I'll never forget standing shoulder to shoulder with the Taliban. The deep-seated hatred as I looked into his eyes. The instinct that wanted to fight. You could tell that it was in him as well. As soon as they opened one of the gates, a whole flood of people pushes through, women, men, and children squeezed between them. Back the F off! Back off! Soldiers scream over and over as somewhere nearby, someone fires off a round of ammunition. As the day comes to an end, the heaving crowd outside stretches for miles. The American troops are overwhelmed by the sheer disorder. It's a security nightmare. The fear is palpable and also justified. Violence is brewing. Something terrible is going to happen. Everyone knows it. The situation is out of control and terrorists thrive in chaos. When a Marine gets some much needed shut eye that night, screaming and gunfire fill his ears. The last thing he saw before he went to bed was a kid trying to pull himself off the razor wire. As the Marine drifts off to sleep, a Taliban soldier outside the wall watches a woman collapse. He too never expected such devastation in the end. For once, the Taliban and the Americans can agree, this is madness. August 18th. It's a similar scene as day breaks. But when that American soldier returns to the wall, he notices more desperation in the air. People are dying from exhaustion. With this added desperation, a literal fight for their lives, the crowd pushes harder, ignoring the Americans' constant shouting to get the hell back. To disperse the crowd, the Americans use more CS gas, firing off non-lethal grenades. Afghans are shot by rubber bullets dropping to the ground. The gate cannot be breached. Any one of those people could be planning to blow up the airport. On this day, desperate parents in the crowd pass their baby on top of the crowd as if it were a piece of luggage. If they die, so be it, but they want their baby to survive. It makes its way to the wall, where a Marine grabs it by one arm and passes it behind him. The picture will be published worldwide. But over the last few days, it's just par for the course. The baby will survive and be reunited with its parents. The child, mother, and father will get out of the country. An elderly man has just died in a tear gas cloud. A woman screams, it's not worth dying for this. She tells her friend to give up. Life under the Taliban is better than suffocation, she says. Those with passports and white sheets of paper in their hands will not give up. The papers they are thrusting in the direction of the Marines are apparently letters from the US Department of State, but of course, these have been copied hundreds of times, so there's certainly no ticket to America. Their names aren't even on them. As the day ends, there's a lull near one of the gates. A man, his shirt covered in blood, his pants caked in his own excrement, stinking and filthy, walks up to an American soldier and says quite calmly, please let me through, the Taliban will kill me. Just following orders, the soldier pushes the man back and he lands in the sewage canal. The Marine hates what's happening here, but the risk is too high to let the man get that close. If he does, he might let the wrong man through and boom, death and destruction will follow. He must follow orders, but for him and most other soldiers, it's an incredibly depressing situation. August 19th. A teenage girl at the edge of the crowd is heard saying, I haven't seen my mom since last night, she's lost. The girl weeps as a concerned woman tells her her mother will be alright. The truth is that scores of kids have been made orphans after their parents died in the crush. Standing in the same shot is a lone boy who has the letters USA written on the back of his hand in black ink. 
Maybe he thinks this will help his chances of getting out. An Afghan man approaches British soldiers belonging to the parachute regiment. He's angry. He's sad. Why did she die? Why not hospital? Why is this happening to us? He's talking about his wife, who the soldiers just covered up after she collapsed and died from the heat and the crunch of the crowd. What is going to happen to our children? The man asks, weeping. I'm sorry, but we did the best we could. We really did, says a British soldier. Another says, my heart breaks for you, mate. Still, these soldiers have to keep pushing these people back. Anything could happen. August 20th. There is some order at last, despite tens of thousands of people around the airport now. More people pass through the gates for processing. The Department of State verifies their papers so these people can get through the terminal and fly out of the country. They clamber into the vast interior of a C-17. On takeoff, the entire plane is packed full. People strapped to the side, sitting on the floor. Some have one bag with them, their life's possessions. Others have nothing with which to start their new life in the USA or wherever else they'll be sent. August 21st. U.S. Intel says one of the gates is currently being targeted by terrorists. A Marine asks another Marine, are they targeting us or are they targeting the crowd? Threat reports are continually issued all day. The north and east gates are at the end of long roads where its feared vehicles will be rigged up to IEDs. There's nothing the troops can do to stop a stampede later on this day. Seven Afghans die, one is a two-year-old girl. Her mother, father, three sisters, grandparents, and cousin abandon all hope of getting out of the country and head back to the city. If there's good news, it's that a pregnant woman who'd been fortunate enough to get on a C-17 gives birth in the air. The mother and baby are reported to be doing fine when the plane lands. August 24th. Both the Americans and the Taliban have received reports that ISIS is here and intends to attack imminently. They've heard this before, but the threat level is now higher. A car bomb is likely, but not certain. Around 21,000 people have already been evacuated, including diplomats and workers from the US and other Western nations. The planes come and go all the time. Around 5,800 US military stay at the airport, plus close to 1,000 British troops. Afghanistan isn't finished with them yet. August 26th. The bomb threat is now at the highest level. ISIS is here. There's little doubt about it. A decision is made to stop processing people through the east and north gates, which leaves one gate open, the Abbey Gate. The crowd around the airport moves and is now concentrated around Abbey Gate. The UK Armed Forces Minister James Hapey tells British news media there will be an imminent lethal attack. All Western nations with citizens in Kabul issue similar warnings. It's not a matter of if, but when. Joe Biden also warns that ISIS will attack, saying that these extremists are not just an enemy of the USA, but a sworn enemy of the Taliban. And then it happens. A huge explosion outside the gate tears through the crowd at 5.50 p.m. local time. The blast blows the head of a woman right off her shoulders. The head lands on the razor wire fence. Looking like something from medieval times, carnage like I'd never seen before, a Marine will later say. His fellow Marines, a few good of them, are part of the carnage lying dead, bleeding out or coming around in a state of shock. Eleven men and two women from the U.S. military die in this attack. 170 Afghans die. Body parts are strewn everywhere. The dying lay on the floor, groaning. There's gunfire, but from whom? It's hard to tell. Later, it'll be said that some Marines panicked and opened fire on the crowd, possibly killing innocent civilians. It's utter chaos. Is ISIS shooting? The Taliban? The Marines? Reports will later emerge that the Marines shot at ISIS men who opened fire, but Autopsy reports will show that citizens died from gunshot wounds. It's unclear how it happened, but they were shot from a higher position. The confusion is indicative of the chaos. Parents and children lie dead on the floor. The sewage canal, the thick feces-filled water, is turning red. A mass of bodies are floating in it. A male body suddenly jerks up from the water, spitting out the filth from his lungs. He's been shot, but he's alive. His three brothers, who with him had all been hoping to get to the US, have been killed by the blast. The U.S. mourns 11 Marines, plus a soldier from the 8th Psychological Operations Group, and a Navy corpsman. Their families will later demand answers. How could this happen, they'll ask. The U.S. hasn't lost a service member in Afghanistan since 2020, and now this. Utter chaos and a lifetime of trauma for witnesses and families. Two of the civilians dead are British dual nationals, one of them a child. Initial reports will say 28 Taliban deaths, but the Taliban will not give the exact number. 150 people have been injured, including 28 Americans. August 27th. A wider perimeter is now established. The tension is so severe, it feels like it'll cause an earthquake. It's now been established that the bomber had worn an explosive vest, walked toward the canal where US forces were checking passports, and blew himself up. According to a survivor, it was as if a giant had whipped the ground from underneath their feet. The British troops, who the press said were offered therapy after the withdrawal, were close by. 
They saw the Americans die, the grisly aftermath of the explosions, men and women they'd befriended, trusted, needed, not to mention the death of civilians who were in bits and pieces all around. There were rumors of a second explosion at a hotel not far away from the airport, but thankfully there is no bomb. Everyone is panicked, everyone is in shock. When will the next attack happen is all they can think of. Bodies or what's left of them are now wrapped up in sheets and laid in lines for families to collect. A young Hazara girl about 8 years old lifts off a sheet and faints. It's her mother. I feel very scared, I have no one, she says when she comes around. She was also injured in the explosion, she's now missing a hand. As she's being treated, a British soldier walks over to a reporter from the independent newspaper and says, We'll look after her, don't worry. Do you know I've been in the army for 12 years and what's happening here is the worst I've ever experienced? A younger British soldier then talks, saying, I've never seen a dead body before. Joining the army, I expected to see people die, but not this. I didn't expect this. Many of their American friends will say the same thing later, that this withdrawal was an absolutely bloody, horrible catastrophe. An Afghan woman then speaks, acknowledging the chaos around her, but saying, I don't know what I'll do if I get turned down. I can't live under the Taliban. That would be impossible. I would rather be dead. She then looks at a dead body close by and thinks about what she's just said, adding, I didn't mean that. I don't want to die. Those poor, poor people and their families. I wonder if people in the world outside realize what is happening here. For US and British soldiers alike, this is carnage. It's unbelievably distressing and stressful. Surely it could have been avoided, they think. Still, they have a job to do. More than ever, they study the crowd. Another bomb attack is expected. They could be next to be covered by a sheet. Just as they're speaking to reporters, someone screams, Get down! Keep down! Later in the day, the US Air Force launches an airstrike against a vehicle suspected of carrying three ISIS members in Nangahar province. Two die. People the Pentagon call high-profile ISIS targets who had been planning another attack at the airport. Lives have possibly been saved. This is positive news, but the threat is still there. August 28th. The stench of rotting flesh is unbearable at the wall. The sewage canal is a soup of feces, urine, blood, and human viscera. At nighttime, dogs come to rip chunks from the rotting corpses. Hordes of them arrive, somehow able to detect a feast of human meat from a long way off. What kind of new horror is this, thinks a marine, shaking his head in disbelief. August 29th. In November, the New York Times will write that the White House and the Pentagon will become the center of numerous investigations regarding the withdrawal from Afghanistan. One of the main reasons is what happens next. On this day, a Hellfire missile strikes a Toyota sedan in a densely populated neighborhood where families live and children run around. The military at first says that bombs were being loaded into the car, that this car had been at a safe house and that there had been an explosion nearby. They say they had no choice but to strike. But subsequent investigations and freedom of information requests prove this to be false. The military lied. The New York Times will later write, Mark A. Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, initially called the Kabul drone attack a righteous strike, but almost everything senior defense officials asserted in the hours, days, and weeks after it turned out to be false. The driver of the Toyota, Zimari Amadi, was said to be at the center of a terrorist plot. He actually worked for Nutrition and Education International, a California-based aid group, and had been loading water bottles into the car. Suddenly, he was in the sights of six Reaper drones. Unaware, of course, what was above him, he was blown almost into non-existence. It was later shown that just as the missile was launched, three little kids had just come to greet Amadi at the car. One second they ran up to him in their excitement, and the next second their bodies were vaporized. Others were killed nearby. The death toll was seven children and three adults. The adults included one translator who worked for the US military. The others had visas for America, having worked for international organizations. Could this withdrawal get any worse? Midnight Contemplation A US Marine smoking a cigarette outside the barracks at the airport peers at the surrounding mountains that are silhouetted on the horizon. He shakes his head, thinking about the last two decades, about the last few days of carnage. He stares at those mountains and thinks about the foreign invaders of the past who'd also regretted occupying Afghanistan. What a country, he says under his breath, while blowing out Marlboro smoke. He thinks about the British Empire's unfinest hour, the 1842 retreat from Kabul, when this mighty country, the most powerful nation on earth at the time, was embarrassed by Afghan tribesmen during the First Anglo-Afghan War. Around 16,500 people in the British column trying to retreat were either murdered, captured, or died from exposure. There was just one European military survivor. A British woman who survived the attack wrote in her diary, The sight was dreadful, the smell of the blood sickening, and the corpses lay so thick it was impossible to look away from them. 
and it took some care to guide my horse so as to not tread upon their bodies. Britain avenged the slaughter, sending an army of retribution to Afghanistan. They crushed the Afghans, burning villages to the ground, massacring soldiers and families, but not before committing heinous acts on the women. After what was called the greatest military humiliation of the 19th century, the Brits got out of Afghanistan with blood on their hands. There would be a second, 1878 to 1880, and a third Afghan war in 1919 for the Brits. Each time the Brits realized what the Americans later realized, that tribal warriors, even if badly paid and badly armed, are a force to be reckoned with. At some point, they'll create untold havoc for the occupiers. The Soviets learned the same thing. Were we ever going to win here, thinks the Marine, squishing the cigarette butt beneath the sole of his boot. August 30th. The Afghan civilians are gone. The last American civilian to leave will be the acting ambassador Ross Wilson. This is it, think the US and the British soldiers at the end. They are finally going home. Aware that earlier in the day anti-missile defenses had to intercept ISIS rockets, they won't feel safe until they touch down on friendly soil. They've smashed everything in sight. They've ripped bed sheets apart, taken hatchets to shelves. They've wrecked every last table, smashed windows, eviscerated car engines and machinery. Right before the final plane leaves, they blow up artillery, rocket defenses and mortar systems that they've been using to protect the airport. The rest of the aircraft are rendered unusable, barely even salvageable. In total, the Americans and to a much lesser extent the British have left hundreds of billions worth of equipment behind. The Taliban at least will get nothing usable from the airport. The last soldier to go is Major General Chris Donahue, the commanding general of the 82nd Airborne Division. His C-17 departs at 11.59 p.m. local time, August 31st. This is where it ends, the 20 years of pain. This protracted toothache of Afghanistan is now over. The Americans shout to the Taliban victoriously are gone. They rush to the airport taking selfies with bashed up American trucks and celebratory group photos. Some of them laugh in surprise when they behold the destruction. In a video a soldier can be heard saying, they didn't leave a single thing undamaged, what a mess. A Taliban fighter will later say in an interview, they spent 20 years using their modern equipment to destroy us, kill us and oppress us. This was the end. President Biden appears on TV telling the people the war in Afghanistan is now over. He talks about the extraordinary success of the mission. For many American observers, this is far from the truth. The only success was that it was over. Despite the carnage, 124,000 people were evacuated in the Kabul airlift, the largest airlift in US history. Most of the refugees have been resettled in the US, but around 20,000 went to the UK and thousands to Canada, fewer to Australia and New Zealand. That's a success at least. General Mark Milley will later call the withdrawal a logistical success but a strategic failure. Afghanistan itself, the country after the withdrawal, was not a success. The economy after the Taliban came back to power plummeted. The UN warned that without help Afghanistan would become home to massive humanitarian crises. Yet, with the Taliban in control, countries were wary about throwing money that way. The US, fearing that Afghanistan under the Taliban might still pose a terrorist threat, froze the country's central bank assets at $9.1 billion, which is still not available. In short, as a nation on the whole, post-war Afghanistan was ducked. It's ducked even with donations, of which about $2 billion is from the US, the biggest of the donors. For the citizenry, it's been difficult under the Taliban and life has been made worse because so many of the best educated citizens left. 97% of the people now live in poverty. Women's rights and rights of expression are almost non-existent. Extremist rule is ruthless, especially for women. China, the country aiming to have more political and economic global influence than the US, says it's planning to invest billions in infrastructure in Afghanistan. And the Taliban just inked an oil drilling deal with the communists. Still, as Western pundits are asking, will China, like the Soviets, the British and the US, lose mountains of money trying to buy stability and influence in this tempestuous region? It's a gamble that might backfire. Now, you need to watch what actually went wrong in Afghanistan or have a look at what caused the Soviet Union to invade Afghanistan.